Hello, hello, hello. Hi, attendees. This is James Kandasamy. Um, today, we're going to be talking about asset protection with a special focus on multifamily investment. Uh, this is a free investor educational webinar series that uh, I'm doing whenever I can and for relevant topics that uh, some of the topics that you don't get anywhere else. But I think it's important as a passive investor or any investor, right? Uh, I was recently reading a book called uh, Mistakes Millionaires Make, and these are the people who lost all a lot of real estate assets in 2008 after the 2008 crash, and they were talking about all the experience. You know, everybody thought they are done, uh, they are top of the world, and until all the lawsuits start coming in, even from lenders, right? Uh, I mean, right now everybody's uh, friends and nice, uh, but when the economy turned around or when something happened, um, you know, you never know what's going to happen. So. I think asset protection is very important. Um, I'm getting my asset protection attorney, uh, Scott Smith, who I engaged him like five years ago when I started in single family um, to join us today. So Scott, let's go to the next slide to just do a quick introduction of myself. And after that, I'll pass the... Uh, um, um, hold on, let me make sure that we are in a full screen. So just to introduce ourselves quickly, we are Chief Investment Group. Uh, we are a private equity firm focusing on raising money from uh, busy high net worth individuals to buy, manage, and hold valued value multifamily assets uh, and deliver above average uh, return on their investments. Currently, we own up to 800 units uh, or control of $56 million in assets, and that is excluding our passive investment. Uh, we also recently won the 2017 San Antonio Apartment Association Property of the Year Award. And if you guys want to visit my website, it's Achieve Investment Group, or my email is over there so that you can uh, continue sending me mails or get in touch with me. So with that delay, I'm going to pass to Scott Smith. And we're going to go through the slides and that Scott has, uh, has prepared. And at the end, please use the Q&A box to ask questions so that we can have all the questions recorded and answered appropriately. So Scott, uh, passing it to you. Great. Thanks, James. Um, so today, everybody, what I'd like to talk to you about a little bit is the top 10 things real estate investors must do uh, to protect their assets. And what we're really focusing on these um, topics is liability protection uh, from lawsuits. <clears throat> One of the key pieces that we're going to be looking at is um, you know, why insurance is often touted as giving people enough protection, uh, but why it isn't uh, enough. Insurance will only protect people against claims for negligence, which is accidents, but that's only one of the many, many types of liability you incur during the operations of your life and your business, um, which can all expose your assets. Um, one of the key mistakes that all, most investors are making is that they're owning property in their personal names, which is a non-starter. Um, for what we should be doing uh, as real estate investors. And today what we're going to be learning about is what are the best uh, practices when it comes to liability protection. So um, if you're a real estate investor, over the course of your real estate investment career, which it, we typically say is about 20 to 25 years on average, you'll have a 95% chance of being sued in a major lawsuit. And that's taken directly from the data uh, from the courthouses. So the question isn't if you'll be sued, but when. We don't know when it's gonna happen, but we're almost sure it will happen at least once. And so that way it's kind of like having a flood uh, happen. We know um, that people are required to buy flood insurance if a flood happens in your area once every 100 years, um, but where the, you know, nobody is requiring anybody to protect themselves from lawsuits. You have to take action on your own to be able to do that. Yeah. Hey, hey Scott, a uh, quick thing. Uh, can you go back to the previous slide? Uh, that that is you, right? That's not a model, right? No, that's me. Um, <laughs> okay. So First time I saw it, I thought it was a real model, but uh, looks cool with the background in the Austin high rise office. Yeah, well, we're yeah we're located as a way of background here. Um, I'm an attorney as well as a real estate investor, and I'm located here in Austin, Texas. Um, with the, my company is Royal Legal Solutions, and we represent clients. 
um, that are real estate investors all over the United States um, and currently have over a thousand active clients um, that we represent in all different asset classes. I'm personally invested in over 10 different states um, and uh, in everything from single to multifamily um, to apartments as well as notes. Um, and I do, because I do a lot of my investing uh, also through clients. Um, and I'm also a burgeoning model. Thank you very much, James. So, um, so the, the key pieces that we want to look at for asset protection is um, we want to be looking at uh, what is the reasons even more so than just being able to protect your money is that a lawsuit, if it happens and you're unprotected, is really a threat that somebody can take everything that you own. Um, there's no limit to uh, the extent of the assets that people can take from you besides what is protected by your IRA and 401k. The only way to protect yourself is by using a company structure. So if you use a company structure, um, if you're ever sued, you'll be protected. And what you'll know is by having those protections in place is that those lawsuits are going to re uh, resolve themselves quicker and cheaper. Um, lawsuits are going to happen in our lives as real estate investors and just as people through lots of different ways. So if you have a car accident that exceeds the limits of liability of your car insurance policy, or you had a couple of drinks ah, and then you decided to drive home, um, those would be reasons that your insurance policy wouldn't cover you potentially and <clears throat> then you would be left with somebody suing you uh, personally for any of the damages of the accidents right also if you had a, a business dealing that you were doing where there's any contracts involved that you had your personal name associated with those contracts you would be the one that they would sue if the deal went sideways if you don't have your assets protected inside of a company structure, a lawsuit against you means they're also taking all of the cash in your bank accounts, your stock portfolios, as well as the crown jewel of your real estate uh, holdings. Real estate is exceptionally bad when it comes from a liability standpoint because it is actually advertising to the rest of the world the value of the asset that they can come take. Right? We understand that lawsuits are a business that people are engaging in them because they think that they can get paid. Um, one of the best ways they can get paid is by having an asset that somebody can't move easily, i.e. real estate, and that's worth a lot of money. So if somebody's looking to sue you and your name is attached to the asset directly on the public records that anybody can go and find out about, well, that makes you a great candidate for a lawsuit. So insurance is one of the best things that we should be doing as real estate uh, investors. Uh, I'm very well insured myself, and I believe that it is something that we can't forego, personally. However, I also understand that insurance is limited. Insurance is only going to protect us against negligence claims. And you're going to find that in practice that insurance is only really going to protect you against small claims. When the claims are big, you find that insurance companies find a way to weasel out of having to pay for those claims, leaving you the direct, the direct person being sued in that lawsuit. Um, and if you want your insurance to pay, you have to turn around and sue your own insurance company. The reason for this is because insurance is a business. It's a business where uh, insurance companies will collect premiums and deny coverage. Now you'll see See this happen a lot on a bigger scale that's much more public um, when you'll have major catastrophes that are going to come through right where you find homeowners having to, to sue um, based on their flood insurance because you know um, you know the hurricane you know some issue with the hurricane right so you can search on Google and you can find all kinds of uh, scenarios involving those types of issues but you're also going to see that are much less publicized of where um, you know the insurance companies will deny the, the little guys um, like yourselves, even if you're a successful investor, right? We're all still little in the eyes of these monster institutions. Um, and they find ways to push us around whenever it suits their interest. So I personally say, I'm going to take control of my life. I'm going to take control of my assets and be protected instead of relying on somebody else that I don't even know to step in with their own benevolence to decide when and if they're going to protect me. So this is the important piece is just remember these fundamental principles, right? Like everything that we're doing um, inside of asset protection is, is fundamentally guided by a few things. 
Um, one of them is that we don't rely on other people like insurance companies to protect us all the time, but we're very well insured because for most instances, in fact, insurance will protect you. But when you're talking about something like a lawsuit that has unrestricted liability, meaning it could be a lawsuit for $10,000, just as easy it could be a lawsuit for $5 million, right? Um, when you're talking about complete financial devastation from a single event, those aren't uh, things that we should play games with. Even a 10% chance is way too high. And the insurance company, I should point out, is going to be covering probably 90% of those issues, right? Because most things are small, right? But we're not worried necessarily about most things. We're worried about the big ones, the ones that would take us, um, could potentially, we wouldn't be able to recover from, or if we could, it would be extremely difficult. So in this slide, uh, for example, is, is speaking about um, how insurance companies are going to be denying coverage. And the way they do that is, um, <clears throat> As we said before, insurance companies only cover negligence claims, and those are referred to as accidents. However, when the accident is really bad, um, they'll claim that it was gross negligence, meaning that it's not going to be something that's covered. The difference between gross negligence and negligence has to do with uh, something that's completely subjective. The insurance company themselves gets to make this determination, where they'll say either this was an, a true accident negligence, or they'll say that this was um, an accident that you knew or should have known was going to happen. That's gross negligence. You tell me how in the world anybody can make that determination. It's completely subjective on their end. So what you find out is that if you look actually at the business incentives behind this, things are gross negligence when they're really expensive and they're negligence when they're cheap. This is the spectrum that you can have for fraud, right? That will happen um, in gross negligence, you can see is right there is a blue circle that's in the middle. And in fraud, we're usually talking about um, a denial of claim that the insurance company is gonna use. Fraud is another way that uh, insurance companies will deny coverage because they'll say, oh, well, you actually actively participated in some way um, and this uh, damage occurring, and that's gonna be a general uh, allegation. And these are the, all the different ways that you could have participated. You could have been, you know, had, it could be inadvertent, it could be negligence, it could be gross negligence, it could be a reckless disregard, meaning that you knew the risk and you just didn't care. Willful blindness says, well, I don't know for sure whether the condition existed or not, but you should have checked it out, or that you actually intended uh, to create that condition. Um, so this is, uh, they really have a large playbook um, for to be able to determine uh, ways to deny uh, covering your claim. And the first, the only, it's the first two all the way at the left that they're going to actually cover, which is inadvertence and negligence. But these are all the different legal standards that we have um, that they can pick from their own playbook to deny your claim. Big fallacies right here uh, regarding people that think that they're protected is that they're honest and they're careful. I don't care how honest and careful you are, it only takes one time uh, for some, something to go wrong. And then all of a sudden you go from being careful to not being careful, right? It's like these things about being honest or careful and careful are always true until they're not. The only way that you know that you weren't being careful is because something went really wrong, right? So the true way to be careful is to say, I'm gonna be protected and that way, even if things go wrong, I'm still okay, right? That's actually being really careful. It's not because I just think that everything is going to be fine and I, nothing's happened in the past, so I don't think it's going to happen in the future. That's not intelligent. <clears throat> so what we look for in a company structure like a series LLC, which is our best type of company structure, is we're looking for a stop gap that says, even if the insurance company denies coverage, what is our worst case scenario? And our series LLC is going to limit that liability as much as possible. So we lose little to nothing in the event of a lawsuit. So the key things that we should uh, be taking away from here is that, um, that you're, as well as with the insurance limitations that are going to come through that we already covered, is that all of these types of protections only work if they're set up ahead of time. Nothing works after the fact, um, the, uh, meaning after the lawsuit is filed. 
anytime you try to transfer assets after the lawsuit, that's uh, called a fraudulent transfer. So any of these uh, strategies that you're ever going to use have to be done ahead of time. And our best ways to be able to do that ahead of time is to compartmentalize as well as hide the assets, which is what something I'm going to cover with you guys today. Um, the cool ways that we can look to actually remove our names from any of the public records associated with the property that we own. So if anybody looks to sue us, it looks like we don't own anything for them to take. If you don't look like you own anything, all of a sudden you find that you're not a target. So the way that um, these lawsuits work is that after a lawsuit, somebody gets a judgment. And then what they do is they go take that judgment to the sheriff and the sheriff comes with his gun and takes your stuff until they can sell it to make enough money to pay off the judgment. And that's in a, in a 10,000 foot up since exactly what's happening with your real estate. They're actually legally coming to steal your stuff and sell it or somebody else to get paid off um, for, you know, from the lawsuit, right? So what can happen though, is that if you have um, uh, a judgment, say of a hundred thousand dollars and you have three properties and the total equity um, in those can be, you know, $150,000, right? For total equity for those three properties, that hundred thousand dollar judgment, they get to foreclose uh, on as many of those properties as they want until the full judgment is paid off. So you can actually be losing multiple properties um, just because of a single judgment. And they get to pick which properties they want uh, to foreclose on. You don't have any control at that point of what they're gonna take exactly. So what we look for in uh, the common structures, structures that we choose to protect ourselves is both the protection from liability, that's gonna be from the company structure, as well as the anonymity which hides our names from the lawsuits and hides the assets so that way um, people can't find out what we own. And that's really how we stop lawsuits before they start is by hiding everything. And then even if the lawsuit does start, um, then the liability protection from the company structure comes in, from that LLC structure comes in to limit um, what all they can take. <clears throat> um, so what we wanna be doing in terms of uh, minimizing our personal liability is we want to be running all of our business activities um, through a separate LLC. So that would be one LLC that we run all of our business activities through and the completely separate. The reason that we do this is so that way if there's a lawsuit um, that springs up, the only person that can sue is this completely empty shell LLC that we've been running all of our business through. This would mean if a contractor wants to sue us or somebody suing for breach of a lease agreement or whatnot, that's gonna go through this completely separate shell LLC. That shell LLC is separate from you. So that means the judgment's not gonna affect your personal assets or your credit score. And it's separate from the asset holding company, which has all of your properties and all of your excess cash stocks, et cetera, held inside of it. Um, so that way all the liability can only go to the shell company and that's how you minimize your business losses um, if anything were to spring up. Um, this is a list in front of us about general partnership, limited partnerships, traditional LLC, series LLCs, and trusts um, are all of the types of uh, company structures you see people use. Um, you should never be using a general partnership, which is if you and an individual buy a property and um, are, are both title holders to a piece of property. Um, that would mean that a lawsuit against either one of you means that you guys lose that property. So basically, if you're entering into a general partnership with somebody, you inherit all of their baggage of anything that happens in their life. Absolutely something that's a non-starter. Um, you can use limited partnerships as well. They're more expensive um, and that I don't think that they make sense unless you're looking inside of a syndication uh, issue or there's a tax issue if you're perhaps a, a foreign investor, like a Canadian investor. Um, traditional LLCs are great, except for the fact that um, all of the assets, if you're holding assets in a traditional LLC, are all in one pool. So then a lawsuit involving one asset would mean that every other asset of that LLC would be exposed. And the systems that we use, we're only using traditional LLCs as shell companies because they're not holding the assets. We don't really care um, about them too much, except for the fact that we can push all of our liability to them um, for our business purposes. What we're going to be using for our structures that are going to be holding assets is going to be using a series LLC in combination with anonymity trusts. That's an anonymity trust that will actually own the LLC itself for any of the government records 
as well as anonymity land trust that will hold title to the individual piece of real estate. Each piece of real estate has its own individual trust um, to hold title, which is in turn owned by the series LLC. So the trust will hold title and it's owned by the series LLC. That provides you anonymity as well as protection. Um, we know the traditional LLC is created in 1977. Before that, people were using limited partnerships. Um, and this was the model they were using that's over here on the right hand side. The person directly owns the LLC in terms of all the public records. The LLC owns the property. That's the old way of doing it. What you'll only find people doing now um, is for apartment complex acquisitions because of the financing um, terms that um, those institutions put in place. So if you're buying um, larger apartment complexes, that's the way to, that you'll likely be needing to go. Um, so as you can see here with the model that we have on the right traditional LLC, all the assets are then pulled together into one company, all the LLC. There's no compartmentalization there. Um, the great thing about LLCs is if you don't have a lot of money to spend, you're much better off having a traditional LLC than nothing at all. If you form these up in Texas, there's a one-time filing fee and no yearly fees um, to form up the LLC. All you have to have is a registered agent, a business address, and your yearly franchise tax filings. Um, as, but you also need to have you know, an operating agreement in place too for your uh, LLC to be validly created, which is um, something a lot of people miss. Um, LLCs, if it's a solo individual, this is true for traditional as well as um, series LLCs. In terms of taxation, um, there's no double taxation on LLC. All of the income is passed through and disregarded to you, the member, um, if you're an individual or a married couple. Um, and if it's unrelated uh, partners uh, that are going to be owners of the LLC or series LLC, um, there'll be a partnership tax return filed uh, for the company and all of the income um, deductions, et cetera, pass through to the members in proportion to their ownership share. So the old way of doing everything is what's represented here, where if you were an individual, you would try to have one LLC per property. And that's the way that you would compartmentalize all the liability. If you do it that way, property, a lawsuit involving property A can affect property B. Why? Because they're in separate LLCs. However, this is also costly, both um, in the formation of each LLC has upfront costs and each LLC will also have yearly costs associated with it um, for registered agent, um, you know, business address and preparation of filing of the franchise taxes, unless you would do those all of yourself, which means you have a time cost associated with, with those as well. The new structure um, that has been around for over 20 years now is the series LLC. Um, this is the series structure. You have one parent LLC that has each of these individual child series as child series A, child series B, and child series C here. Only the parent is filed with the state. So there's only one filing fee, one EIN number, and one uh, company agreement that exists at the parent level. And the parent can have as many children as it wants. There's no limit. Each child as treated for liability purposes as if it were its own LLC. So in effect, you can create on your own desktop as many LLC structures as you want. And they'll be called a child series of the parent LLC, but that's in effect what you're doing from a legal perspective. And you can see from here that since these children are free to create, you're able to scale your business without all of the extra costs associated with filing individual LLCs. Each of these child series, there's no registration form. There's no registered agent. Um, there's no business address. The only piece that has uh, any formation or formalities from the government uh, perspective is the parent itself. So really you only have to have one LLC filed and maintained, even though you're able to create all these child series um, there on your own desktop. So what you could you can do uh, with a lot of uh, with these series LLCs, there's a lot of different types of uh, ways that you can set them up. Um, we recommend that you compartmentalize one asset per entity. Um, now, when we're talking about grouping. Uh, types of assets or businesses into each series. What we're referring to in this scenario is that um, that you would want to have for one series LLC, if 
would be all a passive income. And then if you were going to have a lot of flipping income or active business, you would want a completely separate series LLC for that. And the reason for that is tax returns. With a series LLC, you only have one zero to one tax return, no matter how many individual series you have. But you never want to mix um, active and passive income inside of one company. It's going to kind of lead to adverse tax ruling if you're ever audited. They could potentially tax everything at the higher active income uh, rate. So this is what I was talking about before. The series LLC is the benefits. You have one EIN number, one operating agreement, one bank account, one filing, one tax return, or potentially no tax returns if you're an individual or a married couple. And you have the maximum uh, asset protection with the isolation of each asset. Um, one key piece I just wanted to point out here too is that it is one bank account that you're able to have at the parent level as long as you have accurate accounting records that say what is the income and expenses for each of the individual child series. Now that's going to be able to be done either in your QuickBooks, Excel, or even on paper. Whatever is going to work for you to be able to uh, produce, if you ever had to, to a third party or to a judge to say here's my evidence to show the income that belongs to series A, B, and see as individual companies. And for that purpose, we put companies in quotes, right? Because they're child series, which are companies. But we all know that this, I just point that out so that way there's not confusion about uh, what we're exactly referring to here from this diagram. So the, the best pieces about this is really that all the series LLC structure when it's put in place, everything just runs in the background of your life. There's no complications that increase because you're using a company structure. Your tax preparation is going to stay exactly the same way it is now. Um, you're going to file, if it's you or a married couple, you're going to be filing a schedule E to your personal tax return to all of the income that's being generated um, by your passive real estate investments. But that's exactly what you're having to do now. Um, they the other key piece is, is that you're going to be doing accounting records for each one of your properties anyway because you're a good real estate investor and you need to know what your actual return on investments are for each one of those properties, right? So, um, and the net effect of all of this is that really nothing in your life uh, should uh, change at all except for the fact that now you have a company structure and a bank account associated with that company that you can now park funds into uh, to keep them protected. <clears throat> so there are, uh, the series LLC is in legal terms, a quote unquote newer structure. Um, you're going to find that you can, you can create these in over 13 states, but just like a Delaware LLC, you can create it in one state and use it anywhere, right? We've been hearing about people doing that for forever now. Um, a, a Texas series LLC is our um, optimal series LLC that we use because it's both cheap and strong. Um, and you can create that in Texas and use that um, in any other state. Um, that you would like. You're not going to find a lot of case law on the series LLC, an almost non-existent case law on it. The reason is though, is because the, the laws that establish the series LLC are very clear on what, uh, what they are and they're very strong. And when you have clear laws, you won't have case law that comes about because case law can only interpret what the law is. So a clear law, there's nothing to interpret. When you want to create case law, you actually, as an attorney, you have to go to your client and say, hey, I'd like to spend $50,000 to be able to take this case up through appeal. Well, if I go to my client and they say, well, what's the odds that you can win that case? And I say, well, not very high, actually very, very small because the law is clear. My client's going to say, we're not doing that. And notice that if somebody could be successful, So if you're in challenge, you'll be able to collapse the entire structure. That can only mean that over the course of 20 years, this is a strong structure. Yep. Hey, Scott, uh, can you repeat that? Uh, that because I think we lost your voice just now. Can you just repeat that whole thing from the beginning? Because I think it's important. Sure. <clears throat> so what we know about the series LLC is that you can form it in over 13 different states. Um, now, and it's been over the course of 20 years, but just like a Delaware LLC that you're able to form in one state and use in another and people have been doing that forever, you can form a series LLC in a state like Texas and use it anywhere you like. We personally use Texas because Texas is both uh, cheap and very strong. You can do things in Texas like I failed to accurately do my accounting records and after the fact and I 
can go back and correct them, right? So Texas is very lenient in terms of the laws that they use for it. <clears throat> but even more to the point is about is in the series structure itself that we can take that Texas series LLC and use it anywhere we would like to, just like everybody's been doing with the Delaware LLC. And we know that over the course of 20 years, there's not a lot of case law, almost none, that has come out about the series LLC. Now notice that everybody would be highly incentivized to attack the series LLC because if they won, they would get a huge payday, right? However, you can't, act, you can't be very successful in attacking a law, which is very clear. The series LLC law is very clear. It's so clear that even though people are highly incentivized to attack it, nobody has even actively tried. And, and the reason for that is because case law can only interpret what the law actually is, right? When the law is clear and you go to your client and you say, I have $50,000 of your dollars client that I'd like to spend in attacking this case, I don't think I have a very good chance of winning though. The answer is always no, we're not gonna do that. So the absence of case law on the series LLC should point to the fact that these, the laws are very clear and it's very strong and that there would be, there's no reason to think anybody is going to attack this structure. Now, when we incorporate the series LLC with trusts, now um, things get even stronger because the L series LLC is gonna provide us the compartmentalization of each of the assets. The trusts are gonna provide us anonymity. The trusts with the anonymity is how we stop lawsuits before they even start because people can't find out what you or your company own. Here we can see that if we look at the very top of the structure that, the L, that there's a trust above the LLC. If that was, uh, the LLC was named Worldwide Investments LLC, the trust would be named something like Worldwide Investments Trust, right? That's how easy the naming uh, gets at this point. Um, so, and because the trust is a private document, it means that anybody looking into that um, wouldn't be able to see who is the owner of that trust, which would be you. Um, so this, is, this slide is talking about how we could use um, that trust structure because it's private. Anybody looking as an inquirer is not able to receive any of that information. Okay, this is the big slide because this slide right here is the one that actually uh, shows you the company structure we put together from top to bottom. You see that there's the series LLC near the top that is owned by the trust. That keeps the ownership of the company itself anonymous. Now, if we look down at the bottom, you see all of the individual series, series A, B, and C. Underneath series A, you see a trust. That's the anonymous land trust I referenced to you before. And underneath that is uh, the individual piece of property. Now, what, what's happening in this diagram is that they have the individual property at the bottom that on the deed records is gonna be owned uh, by that trust. Um, if the property was located at 123 Main Street, we would title the trust as the 123 Main Street Trust. We wanna title that trust in a way that it looks like it's a real estate investment trust. Um, so that way, if, any, if your name appears anywhere in the chain of title, if you were the previous owner of the property, it's not a big deal. Um, because the transfer to a trust in that instance is going to look like something that real estate investors do by like doing a wrap or leaving some type of existing indebtedness like your mortgage on the property while selling the property off to other investors. Um, just a slight caveat on that point too is that we use trust structures to transfer the property because a transfer to a trust isn't going to violate the dual on sale clause. Um, like a transfer to an LLC uh, would violate the due on sale clause. And those are from the letters that I've seen from Chase Bank and Wells Fargo um, that has to do with prop people transferring properties to their living trust, create, which has also created a loophole for us to transfer properties to a land trust and that the banks just don't review transfers to a trust anymore. But getting back to this diagram, if you look at the trust structure, it's owned uh, by series A. And that's what gives us the compartmentalization of the asset. So the trust, the 123 Main Street Trust owns the property at 123 Main Street. Nobody can find out who is the owner of that trust because it's a private document. The document itself will then designate that Series A is the owner of that trust. So if there's ever a lawsuit involving 123 Main Street uh, property, 
and it goes through the trust and then the lawsuit stops at series A. They can't go to the parent, they can't go to you, and they can't get to series B and series C or any of the other series. <clears throat> yeah, so here's just really where we're taking a second look at this um, piece of it here to really emphasize that this is the maximum that you can get inside of um, your asset protection because it gives us all the compartmentalization of individual LLCs per property with all the anonymity through the trust. And I also want to uh, point out at this point too is that we're using trust structures instead of um, a Wyoming LLC, which would be another tool people are using to create LLC, uh, anonymity because a Wyoming LLC obviously has costs associated with creating and maintaining that LLC. Uh, trusts are free to create. There's no public filing for them. So the trusts are just a more efficient way in that regard to be able to generate the anonymity. However, if you wanted to use a Wyoming LLC, um, you know, you'd be able to do that. There's just no benefit to it. So once we have our series LLC put in place, and that would be the first thing if you only had a, if you had a limited budget to establish, would be getting your series LLC in place. As you can see here on the right hand side underneath the series LLC, you can hold your house, your car collection, and your yacht if you'd like it to, um, or you know just your rental properties, whatever you'd like. But if you look at further on the right hand side underneath the activities, that's the management company. That's going to be an operating LLC, which is just a traditional LLC. It doesn't own anything, but it's going to be your face to the world. Everything that you're going to do is going to go through the operating LLC. Everything that you own is going to be inside of the series LLC. Um, our law firm does a, a couple of different things. We either can set things up for you with being able to, um, you personally managing uh, the LLCs, um, with all of the compliance work and uh, rigmarole that goes with needing to do your registration, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a lot of our clients, though, uh, prefer to have us take care of that for them to ensure that all of their corporate maintenance is going to be handled appropriately, um, as well as we provide services for you for any ongoing questions that you have, uh, any call, email that you have about your company structure, we answer those free of charge. We call that whole service a family office uh, service. These are the typical fees that you would expect associated with um, companies for you to be able to uh, establish them and maintain them. Um, these, these are well over a thousand dollars as an aggregate of what you would need to be able to run the structure we just talked about from franchise tax filing to registered agents to um, ongoing reviews to ensure there's no piercing of a corporate veil occurring for any nominee trustee services. If there has to be a disclosure of who is a trustee of a trust, we would step in. Uh, to be able to be that nominee trustee on your behalf. Um, we are the IRS designated representative uh, for you. So that way, um, every communication, every problem, anything that can go wrong, we either take care of it or we're the point person to be able to get you know boots on the ground and start to handle it as quick as possible. But the idea here is that uh, our law firm is able to fully establish the structures, make up, set everything up for you, so it's extremely easy for you to use, and we handle any and all of the headaches that come potentially um, with you actively engaging in the business of uh, buying and selling real estate as it relates to your company structure. And we do all of these um, all of these services that we do here. We take care of those currently as part of a yearly membership for the family office. Um, which is a little less than $600 a year. We bill it out at $49 a month. Um, this is just a last uh, slide to be able to um, remind you guys about um, what you should be looking for when you're investing in real estate. I always recommend, you know, go meet up with your local investors, read some books, get on the podcast, and be able to learn as much as you can um, from there. Uh, most of all, get on podcasts. I do a lot of podcasting. If you are interested more in this information, if you just come to my website, royallegalsolutions.com, or um, Google my name, you're going to find that I speak on bigger pockets and major podcasts with about real estate. Uh, I would probably stay away from big firms if I were um, in y'all's position, because what you're going to find is big firms are going to to do good work, but it's going to be about five to six times the cost, so about 600% more expensive than going with local firms um, and our smaller firms that are um, specialized in your area. And whether you're hiring an attorney, a CPA, or any other professional to help advise you, make sure that they're doing the same business you are. That's one reason I do this asset protection as an attorney is because I'm also a real estate 
um, investor. So knowing the ins and outs of what actually works and not just works in theory is something um, that you know I pride myself on. Um, so this is our company over here at the left. You'll see um, our office number as well as my direct email address if anybody would like to reach out. Um, total cost to typically set up one of these structures is you're typically looking at anywhere between two and four thousand dollars to set up the company structure depending upon what you need. Um, you're looking at somewhere around three hundred dollars per property and the ongoing maintenance is, is uh, typically um, around that. We typically include that in that forty nine dollars a month. Um, uh, membership, which is a little less than $600 a year, but that's what you should be looking in, in terms of total cost. Um, I think we're the most price competitive in the market for being the most efficient of what we do, um, but we're also, I think, the best in terms of uh, the types of protections that we're able to give everybody. So um, I'd really like to open it up now. If anybody has any questions, uh, I'd be happy to address those. Okay. Uh, yeah, we have a quite a number of Q&A, but before we go further, I have, I have, I have a lot of questions myself. So so I have investors uh, who invest passively with me. And some of them have a revocable trust, some of them through LLC, some of them under their personal name. So does it matter whether for passive investors, uh, whether it should be under personal name or trust or LLC? So you would want uh, every single person in their life should always have a living trust established to be able to say what's going to happen with their assets when they die, especially if they have real estate. Because without a living trust, all of your assets can be caught in probate, which can be devastating for your real estate investments um, because rents might not get collected, insurance might not get paid, et cetera, right? You need a living trust so immediately somebody else can control a property and make sure it's taken care of. And they should also have an LLC that's owned by that living trust. So that way their assets are protected during their life. Something being held directly in the name of the living trust offers no protection. Then in terms of when you're, when you're investing with a third party as an investor, you would always only want to invest with them um, if they're investing in an LLC structure. So I don't mind investing with you, James, as long as you're gonna have an LLC established that I'm buying an interest in because my investment is then protected through your LLC. Now, I might wanna do that investment through my own LLC because if I am sued, they can come after any distributions you would make to me in your investment. Well, that's different than if, they, if, you, if my asset holding company is the one that made the investment with you, then you can make the distribution directly to my asset holding company. That means that if I'm sued, people still can't touch my money. Okay, okay, so what you're saying is uh, for passive investors, and I just, I mean, even the for, you know, for a sponsor like or deal syndicator like me, I mean, if, if they come with an LLC, at least the, we are protected because if they get sued personally, but the LLC is still a different entity, right? So we are protected in that case, I guess. Yeah, if they're investing through an LLC with you, that makes sure that your deal is protected. It means nobody's going to be able to jump into this deal that's a third party okay. with you. And it also means they're protected. Because then if they get sued and you need to distribute money to them, then you can just put that into their LLC instead of distributing it to them. If you distribute it directly to them and they're underneath a lawsuit or they have a judgment against them, somebody can come in and take that money. So I really okay. protect both of you. So ideally what you want is to encourage, you need to be investing through an LLC with any of the deals or a series LLC with any of the deals you're creating. And the clients themselves should be investing in, uh, into your company through their own LLC. Okay. And this trust that you're talking about, is this revocable, irrevocable trust or what is the distinction between that two? Yeah, you're revocable. always going to be, want to be using revocable trust because that's the way you get the best tax advantages. Because okay. revocable trust is disregarded. If you go irrevocable route, it's, um, it either offers no asset protection um, or if it does offer asset protection, what it's likely going to do is have some pretty serious tax consequences. So always re irrevocable trust, I guess. And uh, the other question I have is, uh, you said the uh, the company that's holding this, uh, you know, apartment complexes that can be under traditional LLC because you know usually Fannie, Freddie, or any lender, multifamily lender would want that. Um, so that that is true, right? That should be under traditional LLC, not under a trust, because I never tried a trust on that. I don't know whether it works or not. No, you always have to do the financing underneath just a traditional LLC, because that's otherwise they have to do all kinds of exceptions and exclusions. Okay. Right? It becomes expensive. 
But what you could do is after the after the closing, you could transfer that property into an anonymity land trust that would be owned by the LLC. And that would be a way of giving you some uh, anonymity inside of the asset ownership. Okay, got it, got it, got it. Um... And, and I don't know, one, one last question before I let everybody else ask their question is, I don't know whether you can answer this or not. Uh, so when, when a passive investor invests with the LLC, are they able to claim uh, tax benefits like, you know, all their meals and travel expenses related to the business, even though they're Yeah, passive? absolutely. All of the benefits, uh, once you have a company structure, all of the benefits and all the income will all flow to you, just like they did before. Nothing in your... Um, your taxes is adversely affected. Even though they are passive? Yeah, even though they're passive. Okay, so basically in general, you're saying for passive investors, the best way for them to invest in all this uh, syndication is through an LLC. I mean, I mean, apart from the asset protection side of it, right? because they get the yeah. tax benefit and they can do, you know, it's a protection for everybody, right? In case somebody gets sued. Yeah, it's all part of, you know, operating the business. And of course, talk to your CPA about your, your particular situation, because that starts getting into a lot of how would you pop, how would you do that effectively it can really depend upon the circumstances, right? But you, that's why you need an aggressive CPA to, to inform you on saying, okay, well, what's a way that you can legitimately start to claim those? Okay, okay. So let's go to the uh, questions. Uh, the first question, uh, so having so many different, are, are you able to see this, Scott? The, I, I can't see them. Okay. Let me so see the, the Q&A if I open up a box. Okay. Yeah. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. So the first question is, so having many different passive investments under the same LLC seem like a bad idea. That's a question. Um, so the issue to say is why does it actually seem like a bad idea, Carlos? Um, because the, the passive investment would be, um, if it's all underneath one LLC, you're right, because what would happen is if there's a lawsuit against one asset, it would affect all the other assets, right? So that's why we use a series LLC structure, uh, is because then we're, you know, we're compartmentalizing all of the risk yet. So when we talk, about, and, and to jump into your second question, Carlos, is about the general acceptance, you're going to find that um, you're able to form it in, you know, 13 different states now, it's been over for 20 years, and I think I went over that in detail about, uh, why why it's a good asset we still also see legislation proposed legislation that should be coming through that states will generally be formally adopting um and, and with inside of the next year or two um and at that point you'll see everybody will be switching over to the series llc so what we're doing right now is just ahead of the curve right and uh, how much did you say it costs to create, once you set up the parent LLC and one series LLC, how much does it take to create another series uh, yeah. for different investments? Yeah, so total cost that you'd be looking at is it's typically between two and $4,000 to set up the parent company, right? That fully forms a parent. Filing fees, operating agreements, everything. From there, your only cost would be $300 per property to transfer it into the company structure. And that's going to include everything that that property needs, an individual child series, a land trust, as well as the deed uh, to transfer the legal ownership. Okay. Uh, let's go to the next question. Uh, Michael Solik, like if the passive investment we are invested is in already in C LLC, isn't that enough protection? Oh, I'm sorry, who was that? Michael? Michael Solik, like, yeah. And the question is if the passive uh, investment is already right? does. It on the asset, right? So it, it depends on the number of assets. They're looking at saying like, if, if you have more than one asset in any individual LLC, it depends upon your risk tolerance, right? If you have 30 assets in there, then all 30 are exposed if there's a lawsuit in one. What my proposition is in here is trying to say, this is a cost effective way that you can compartmentalize every single asset and it can scale with you for very little cost as you grow as an investor. So why wouldn't you take advantage of that? If the downside risk is a lawsuit against one asset wipes out tons of equity. I mean, we're not talking about huge numbers here in terms of cost, right? When you think about like buying um, insurance, for example, that's typically what you're looking at this being. It's an insurance against all of the other types of claims that, insur that your other insurance isn't covering. And it's a way to round out all of your protection to say, you know, are you happy being 80% protected with your future that looks like it's probably going to be an asset that you're looking to build your retirement through, or do you want to have 100% protection? 
right? So really that's just a fundamental question that each of us gets to answer for ourselves. And is saying, if you're okay floating the risk, shoot, you might not even want property insurance if you didn't have it, right? Because you'd say, I don't think anything bad's gonna happen, right? But we typically say, well, that's probably a bad idea. So I think something should be pretty clear. I mean, uh, before we go to the next question. So in terms of the syndication where we have general partnership and limited partnership, I think we talked about the LLC from the limited partnership or passive investors. But in the case, let's say GPs are being sued, general partnership are being sued. I mean, limited partners are always protected, right? Because they don't hold any liabilities, right? In a passive investment. Limited partnerships are the way that we, we do for syndication deals. And it was actually what everybody did before LLCs existed. So it's a way to get LLC protections without an LLC being able to exist. And then once LLCs existed, now everybody switched over for their individual stuff to start using LLCs. And the only reason that people use LLP, LL, LPs now is for syndication deals. Okay, so basically they're protected just because of the way it's structured, I guess, right? So, right, okay. exactly. Okay, let, let's go to the next question. Uh, how much annual cost for the traditional LLC? I believe that was covered, uh, right, uh, Scott? Yeah, that's for right. Yeah, like it really depends on what all you're going to need, but you should typically be looking at, um, there's some discount services that you're able to get for, if you just need a traditional LLC, you're probably looking at spending, le you're spending less than a thousand dollars a year um, as a one-time cost and $200 annual um, for those because you don't need, you know, anonymity costs and, and whatnot associated with it. Um, and, and do you do that services as well? Yeah, we do that as well, right? So if there's okay. any, for any investor with any asset class and just about any situation, we have a solution that's gonna be cost effective and the best solution available um, from a legal perspective because helping real estate investors is 100% of the practice that we do. Um, and, it, and there's also this uh, solution just going over to at, um, is that Agus Hartano's question here is that, you know, would you, what would you need to do if you own properties in multiple states? And this is where the land trust really shines. It's because the land trust is going to be holding title um, to the individual properties in every state. The LLC isn't technically doing business in all the states. So you don't have to pay foreign registrations for your LLC and all the yearly costs for every state that you're going to be owning property. There's a huge tax uh, or a huge tax of upkeep savings uh, by switching to a series LLC structure and owning all of the properties through land trust. Okay, let's go to the next question. How much does it cost to set up series LLC? I think that was already covered. Yeah, so and we, we currently what we do is we have a, if, it, if you know, if you call in, um, the process that we work through is that you call in and have a quick discovery call, which usually takes about 15 minutes where we usually will find out um, whether you have is one that we help with. Um, and then what we'll do is we schedule a consultation. We charge $150 for the consultation, which we then apply as a credit to any services that you engage us with going forward. So it comes right off the top of whatever your final bill would be. Um, but that's a way that we've been able to, um, you know, uh, save some of my time to say, hey, you know, are you a good candidate for us? And if you are, you know, this is the way that you get your, you know, a half hour for, um, with your time with Scott. And with that, we also include with you about 40 minutes of videos that, you know, goes into depth explaining um, even more of uh, what you have going on here with the structure before you even jump on the phone with me to find out um, the exact nitty gritty details to all of your questions. Okay, let's go to the other question. Um... For active assets, is it, recommend, is it a recommendation to have one asset per series or for groupings together? Yeah, so each individual series of the series LLC, it's able to have its own operating agreement and its own EIN number and generate its own tax return if it wants to. Most people don't because they want everything streamlined, you know, up through the parent and to them so they can report on their personal income tax return. Um, however, if you're, uh, this sounds like something you'd be doing uh, for flips, Alex. And if you're looking at flips, the series LLC makes a lot of sense because um, once you would do the flip out of series A, you would never use series A again. So that way, if there's ever a lawsuit involving series A after you sell the property, they're suing an empty company. Compare that with doing an LLC, where then two years down the road, you sell the property, 
Um, and then they come back and sue you while you have four flips that you're actively doing. And now all four of those flips are tied up inside of a court case because somebody sued your LLC. So series LLC helps you um, keep from having any skeletons in the closet. Okay, let's go to the next one. The individual series don't require separate EIN. I, you said one EIN for all the series, right? Because it's one. Yeah, parent usually the parent LLC. itself will have an EIN number that you're going to need for your bank account as well as to say where you got the income on your Schedule E. But the each individual child series don't need uh, separate e EIN. Okay. Can you convert an existing traditional LLC into a series LLC? Uh, you can. Um, it's pretty expensive to do so. It's around $1,500 by the time we actually uh, finish uh, forming up all of the documentation to change it and pay the filing fees with the state um, to do it. And when you go that route, you're foregoing any of the anonymity benefits because uh, your name's already disclosed on the public record. Oh, okay. Okay. But it's still cheaper than creating everything to uh, from ground up, right? For series right, one. yeah. If you said, "Hey, I don't care about anonymity," then yeah, that would be a cost savings. Okay, okay. Uh, if I was to set up series LLC, how do I transfer all of my investment from my name to LLC? So that's where we would um, compose deeds to file with the county to then transfer the property into the individual land trusts that are owned by the series LLC. That's the way the property is. Made. Okay. Okay, but if they're passive investor, I think I think I think uh, I think yeah, that's that's quite active investor. If the property is you know you are the GP on it, but I, I believe if you're a passive investor, I think the paperwork is done by the uh, attorneys, like whoever created the company operating agreement. And usually it's like, um, I mean I know because a lot of my passive investors do this. They first start with their own name and later move to LLC, and usually it costs like two hundred to two hundred fifty for the lawyers to prepare that document. Yeah, change. that's right. Those are typically called an assignment of interest. Correct. Assignment of interest. Correct. And that's the way they're going to move those over. It'll be about $250. Yeah. Yep. So the next question is from Alex again. Now, for what reason do large complex require traditional LLCs as opposed to series LLCs? That's because I think that's for the GP. Yeah. I think that's what's uh, mandated by the lender, right? Uh, right. That's a lender. But that's the only reason. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the next question, if I'm not a resident of uh, Texas, what is the best way to create a Texas series LLC? Uh, if you want to reach out to me, I'm happy to do that for you. And that's what you would do it is to create the, you can, you can file, uh, you as an individual can file an LLC in any state just by contacting the uh, county clerk. I'm sorry, the secretary of state. Okay. So the next question is, uh, Bill Chatterjee, since series LLC is reported on schedule in personal return, does that mean that we will not be able to take advantage of the 20% LLC business profit deduction that come into play in 2018? No, because Bill, of course, you're going to be able to take advantage of those deductions because that's still, those are the passive income deductions. And that flows through to you just as if you didn't have a company. Okay. Yeah, I don't think so. They will. It's a business deduction. Yeah, it's a business so, deduction, correct. Yeah. So the next question, will there be an example showing cost of creation of the setup? I think we did go through the whole setup. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that would have been answered. I was told if the house title is being renamed to a trust or LLC, what are the risk impact from lender bank? If it's a transfer to an LLC, it's going to be in violation of the due on sale clause and they can asset. If it's a transfer to a trust, you're going to, um, it won't be a violation of the due on sale clause and you wouldn't expect any action from the bank. And the nuts and bolts of all of this is no matter which way you go with that, as long as you continue to pay the mortgage, you shouldn't expect anybody to foreclose because banks are in the business of lending money and collecting on that, not on foreclosing. Uh, Scott, Scott, can you repeat that? I think we lost yeah. your sentence. Right. Yeah, so uh, the banks are in the business of lending money and collecting, right? So as long as the mortgage is being paid, you'll find that nobody uh, is going to proceed with any uh, foreclosure proceeding. The worst that would ever happen is that they might send you a letter but the, the letters that I've seen from the banks, from Chase and Wells Fargo, show that uh, transfer to a trust that they don't pursue those ever. Okay. Assuming that I have the mortgage loan under my name. I think that was the question we have. Uh, one member LLC is risky? Uh, it depends what state it's formed in. If you form it through Texas, it isn't. Also, Texas one member LLC is okay? 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next one, um, uh, coming back to Jason again, but I heard the Texas probate process was pretty simple in terms of most property will not go to probate court. The question is, is what do you want to have a risk associated with property being caught in probate? Or do you want to be sure that there's not going to be an issue? And you're only talking to be able to establish a living trust and, and a, a, a will. Uh, in this scenario, you're talking about $1,000 or so to be able to put that together, depending on the complexity. And that's a one-time cost that you set up once that then takes care of everything for you, right? And you would never even need to update because all of the assets that you have are going in and out of the company structure, which is owned by your living trust, right? So that's where we, this is where uh, I think that we do a really good job as a company is that all of the pieces that we're putting together for people are things that are um, good now and require little to no work uh, moving forward with their life. So if you have a trust, do you still go to probate court? No. The, I mean, you won't, you won't go to probate court. You'll go to probate court for stuff like who gets to take your jewelry or your watches and your clothes and stuff, right? But anything that's inside of the living trust that avoids probate, which is why you have all of your assets in there. Okay. But probate court is for is anything that passes underneath the will. And what these wills establish, what we do is what's called a pour over will, which says anything um, that I have that's not inside of my trust, I want you to take it and pour it into the trust and distribute it how the trust says. So it's a simple one page will. Okay. So you're saying that put all your assets under this uh, revocable trust and that will simplify things you know, rather than going to probate court, I guess. Correct. Okay. So the other cost is what's the cost uh, to form a living trust and LLC for passive investor. Yeah, so I mean, but you should be expecting somewhere between, you know, around a thousand dollars for a living trust and will. Um, and LLC depends on what you need. Like a, traditional LLCs are typically a thousand or less, and the more advanced structures you would, you know, can range up to four thousand dollars. Okay, and you do the real part also, right, Scott? Correct. Yeah, we do. Um, everything that has to do with company structuring as well as estate planning. Okay, okay. Uh, the next question is, is there an accreditation requirement for passive investor? Is that an issue if passive is using an LLC entity? No, there's no accreditation requirement. Okay. Uh, next question is from Praveen. Is separate LLC recommended? Yeah, I think we covered this. Is separate LLC recommended for each and every passive yeah. investment deal? And you said yes, right? Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, if you want a series LLC, I guess. A series LLC is much more efficient, right? And then what you would want to be combining with that is what's known as it's the revocable trust uh, is the one that's going to be able to give you the anonymity and the pass through tax treatment and the low cost. Okay. Okay. So the next one is, did we say the trust has to be revocable or irrevocable to have protection and low tax costs? I think the answer was revocable trust, right? You said all yeah. trust should be revocable trust. And what's the, what's, the def, what's the reason why irrevocable trust doesn't have that protection and low cost? Well, tax? It's, it's a tax issue. Revocable, irrevocable trusts are taxed differently. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, I didn't know that. Um, the next que question is, what is the impact of moving from personal ownership to LLC to existing mortgage? Also, when an asset is in trust or LLC, what's the impact on getting loan or refinance? Do you know? Um, so in terms of lending, you have to always play by the rules that the lenders line up for you. Um, so what you want to do typically is you're going to re you're going to finance the properties in your personal name, and that's how you're going to get the cheapest rates, and then transfer it back into um, the company structure to be able to hold. Um, next question, Michael Long. For mobile home parks where the units are park owned by owner, not tenant owned, would each of these units be in an individual LLCs? Or yeah. would each mobile home own traditional LLCs? Yeah, it really depends, right? Like, um, there's a couple of ways to slice that cat, and that'd be like a good question to actually call in to the office for. Okay, <laughs> yeah, that's a bit more tricky, I guess, right? Okay. Um, next question by Richard, uh, if passive investing to their self-directed IRA, is it still recommended or necessary to have them an LLC? Um, 
Well, Subdirector IRA, they have their own account, right? Uh, you know, like Subdirector IRA, a custodian and all that, right? Yeah, so we, we do is we typically will set up um, check IRAs with checkbook controls for people. And typically they'll have an LLC that the IRA owns and then they invest through that LLC, which is how they um, both protect their IRA uh, from any lawsuits as well as save themselves on custodian fees. Because we are, we're able to do that for self-directed IRAs. We have an offering that um, we pay for the, all of the custodian fees uh, for you. It's $250 uh, a year and a one-time setup cost for your entity, whether it's an LLC or a business trust, whatever is going to make the most tax sense for you uh, for $1,200. But you know, if you just had a traditional self-directed IRA and you're paying your custodian those fees to enter into the agreements for you, you can invest um, inside of a third-party investment as long as it's that third party is using an LLC, you're likely going to be fine. So let me understand correctly. So you're saying that if they do to sub direct do they still need that custodian like equity trust or it's another company I can remember. Do you still need that or you can still do the custodian part of it? Yeah, we also will do the custodian part of it. Oh, okay. So they can take from IRA and get your services to be a custodian right. of it. Yeah, they can roll over their IRA to us and get these cheaper yearly fees. I think we're the most competitive in terms of yearly fees that combine that with the legal um, support because uh, all the rest of the custodians and IRA companies I can find, none of them are able to give you legal advice because none of them are the law firm. So we're actually able to do both at uh, cheaper rates and get people the checkbook control entity, which allows them to invest in you know, Bitcoin, real estate, whatever they like to do. And manage it all themselves okay that's interesting i didn't know that okay let's go to the next one uh, by milana so the structure for passive should be a living trust parent llc child series llc that's right, right? correct yeah that's right yeah that's right how difficult is it to move to more to move passive investment into a series llc i think uh, we did cover that yeah. Um, I think the current passive investment, I, I think, yeah, we said uh, you have to do paperwork with the lawyers to, uh, once you create the series LLC, the lawyers will do a assignment of membership uh, paperwork, which costs like a 250. That's how uh, I've seen my passive investor has been doing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, and all of these costs um, establish the LLC itself or to establish any of the children or land trusts that we talked about here are all one-time costs. The only ongoing costs that you have with this type of structure is the yearly maintenance and ongoing legal support, which is that, which we do as that uh, $49 a month membership to the firm. Okay. Okay. Um, I think the continuous question and each child LLC is different for passive investment. Yeah, that, that's right, right? Every passive investment mm -hmm. you recommend to have a serious LLC created. Correct. You have a shield between the, each of it. Okay, the next one, uh, will you lose important tax benefit like depreciation tax deferred exchange if property is held under LLC or retirement plan? No, like all of those uh, flow through. Okay. Um, I think the next question by Milana is how long is your consultation? Yeah, we find that uh, 30 minute consultation gives you all the information um, that you're going to need um, to, to be able to know like, what, what strategy is going to work best for you. Um, but that's pretty loose, right? So some people take less time and some people need more. But it's whatever you need. Okay, good. Um, next one by Anonymous is the 300 $300 to transfer property to series LLC, a one-time cost or? That's a one-time cost. Yeah, it's a one-time one -time cost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is just a paperwork to change the Schedule A on your operating agreement. Uh, the next question, does it make sense to put my home in a trust? Um, it depends. I mean, it really depends on your exact situation, Michael on whether that's gonna make the most uh, tax pieces. I can tell you that what, the way that the, this, is, the way this works in a 10,000 foot up approach is that we always go to your CPA first. We ask the, C, the CPA the question of, well, how do we get the best tax benefits? And then we work backwards from there to find what's the entity structure that's gonna allow you to maximize the taxes. 
And there's nothing, a good attorney that knows how to do this kind of work, it's always going to be able to find how you can use, get the maximum protections without losing money on your taxes. Okay. I think in the next question he has is, I have an S-Corp for my regular business. My CPA said to buy multifamily as an individual. This is the best way to maximize tax and asset planning protection. Right. I'd have to talk to your CPA to find out what the full story is. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, will the slides be available for us to later review? Yes, I will send the slides and the recording after the webinar. Next one, uh, I'm in the middle of a contract and soon to have construction loan that later to be converted to a permanent loan due next year. Should it be better to complete the whole thing under my name first, then transfer to a trust or build the structure now before closing next year? Yeah, so there's nothing to be gained um, by waiting, right? So by establishing the structure now, you're doing things like setting up the bank accounts and getting all of your familiarity with, um, with the structure itself. And then it's ready for you. So at the day after you're able to complete the current transaction, you'll be able to transfer the property into the protected structure. Okay, good. Uh, I think the next question is an idea. That's a really good idea. Thanks, Carlos. <laughs> so, uh, by Gregor, what happens when all member of the LLC dies? <laughs> <coughs> Go ahead. Scott, oh, I, I yeah, don't know how so, to answer that. Yeah, so what's going to happen is that if it's, it really depends upon what the operating agreement is going to say, but that likely means that it goes to their heir, heir, right? So like there's going to be an attorney involved in that that's going to be working with you about who's going to be the next person that's going to get inserted into uh, your LLC for the member that died. Yeah, I think the way that my LLCs are written is it goes to their heirs, right? So, I mean, there's, there's a long procedure there. So if you look at all your investments, uh, look at the LLCs, how it's being written, but in general, that's how it's being written for myself. Uh, the next question uh, by Milana, if you transfer all of passive investment that are in personal name to trust and structure LLC, will the anonymity be lost? No, because the anonymity is obtained through the trust itself. So we're not worried about things that are in the chain of title or previous ownership. When people are filing lawsuits, they're worried about what do you currently own? And so if you can mask that name um, from your current ownership, that's enough to be able to create the insecurity that we want to dissuade them from filing the lawsuit. Because at best, they'd be guessing, right? But if they already have the names under their current name right now and they transfer it to a trust, I think, yeah, I think, wouldn't they know from the previous LLC? I mean, uh, they'll be able to see who owned it, right? Yeah, so, you know, that's what I mean. It really depends, right? Ideally, no, right? But there's some instances, like, um, that it's unavoidable that your name is going to appear. If it's a passive investment inside of a, a you know, a somebody else's private LLC, there's no public disclosures to that. So, you know, I'm wondering in that circumstance, does anonymity really make a lot of sense even there, right? Or are we just really kind of worried about investments that we have that have our names to the public? If our names are exposed to the public, then we would want to be using trusts in that circumstance. But in any event, you're always going to be creating uncertainty if, if the asset is transferred to a trust, no matter what circumstance you're looking at, because nobody knows what the trust, who owns the trust. So it could just as well be an anonymous third party as it could be you, right? Okay, makes sense. Uh, the next question, how do you determine when stop making serious LLC? So the question is, you know, do you have after Z, you know, <laughs> what happened? No, you can really create as many as you want, right? And there's no real reason to, um, to stop. I find some people say that, hey, after we have three or $4 million in equity in a single series LLC, let's just go ahead and start up another one. Um, just, just because, right? Like maybe at some point it doesn't make sense to have too much money in any structure, no matter how secure it is, right? That's kind of like saying like you don't keep all of your money in one bank, even if it's the safest bank in the world, right? But uh, I, that really is like a long shot of anybody really needing to worry about that for the average investor. If you do, then talk to me and let's start setting up some offshore stuff. I mean, forget domestic LLCs, we should start putting your money in you know, Cook Islands and stuff. Okay. Um, the next question uh, is the ongoing membership maintenance $49 a month include also consultation if you have questions. Absolutely. Yeah. Any questions that you have at any time. Okay. 
Next question. Uh, if moving passive investment from traditional LLC into serious LLC, you know, $300, does the GP, lead investor of each investor, have to change all their paperwork and uh, reporting checks info? Yes, I think, yeah. yeah. Right now, I have people changing from their personal name to LLCs. And yeah, the lawyer that, you know, we get the paperwork to be done, they charge us like a per hour fee on that paperwork. Yeah, and I mean, I would say on that, like reach out to us and let us know exactly what, you know, what needs to be done there. We can get you a quote on what that would be. Yep. Okay, so uh, have you ever been handling cases in the court when dealing with losses from your clients? Yeah, I, used, I was a litigator uh, for um, a couple of years before I actually started um, doing asset protection, which is now about four years full time as my sole practice. So I'm litigating cases all the way through court to judgment. Okay, next question is, if you use our name for passive investment, then it's already in public record with moving to LLC, then to series LLC have that. I think you answered this question just now, right? Yeah, the way that we do that is, is through the anonymity trust, right? So that's the way that you would actually create the anonymity um, in there. Because we're not worried about who owned the asset before. People are only suing based upon who owns the asset. Okay, I think we are at the end of our session. Uh, thanks for all the questions. Uh, I'm gonna be make these slides and the recording available. Just for the record, out of all my passive investment investors, I have one passive guy who's using a series LLC. So just for the record. Um, I think that's it. Uh, any, any last uh, comments, Scott, from you? Oh, no, that's it. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks to all of you guys who have attended. Um, goodbye. Thanks, Scott.